it was this sudden realization. I sort of blurted it out. It was in between a song. This is the best day of my life. I hadn't realized that that was what I was heading towards. My life is a sort of soap opera. You know, it's not drama, it's not opera, it's a soap opera. It's like ludicrous a lot of the time. I could play music, I could write songs. I'd been obsessed with rock and roll since I was a kid. We didn't have money, and so there wasn't television, telephone, fridges, there wasn't any of that. My father wasn't there, my mum was dead. I was by myself at home, a kid. There was no one to make me do homework, so I failed my exams. I just read and listen to the radio. The one rock and roll station in Europe, Radio Luxembourg. Is your station of the stars, radio Here are these young men and women talking about whole other universes other possibilities and here's the words to use here's the rhetoric it's called rock and roll here they were articulating something otherwise inexpressible to me at that time but that's right yeah those words by the people of our generation whose names we all know were what i lived by I couldn't get along with authority. My instinct is to jib against it. It's, I know it's childish. I mean, of course, I cooperate with it often. Bono and I go along and meet leaders. It's not we've worked out anything. Good cop, bad cop, you know, I'm bad cop. He's there being, you know, embracing and like, you know, doing the Bono thing, which he does brilliantly and I'm there sort of going, <laughs> you know like a kid like in the background going, <laughs> and like yeah yeah you know I don't actually do that but my head is doing that I'm not a against the fact that we have to have people who sort of run the show I personally am against people in authority the paradox at the, the heart of individualism is that it only works when we act in concert for the common good You can't just be John Wayne. John Wayne nearly always needed the 7th Cavalry appearing at the last minute on the hill. Band-Aid, stuff like that, was just realism. My band, the Boomtown Rats, was coming to the, towards the end of its career. If I do this song, it's not going to be a hit and therefore we won't make money to try and stop what was happening in Africa. So practically, what do I do? I get the friends I'd made in 10 years in rock and roll, especially those now having hits, together to do this song. We just go underneath it. Okay, so. What we're trying to do is raise as much money as we can to send as much food and as many drugs that we don't absorb as we can to um, the affected areas of Africa, whether it's Ethiopia or Sudan, it doesn't matter. Why at this time did you decide to do this? It was the six o'clock news at a time when there were really only two, two channels. BBC, that's the news. Six o'clock, that's the main news. In from work, just before tea, you watch it. They gave it 10 minutes at the top of the hour, 10 minutes. And it was a brilliant piece of journalism. Michael Burke made you see and feel this horror. There was this outpouring of rage. I thought we'd make 100,000 pounds, you know, because all these guys were superstars. Give it to Oxfam, and that was the end of it. It was Christmas. I remember a picture of a butcher shop in Plymouth. There was your turkey, your goose, your pig, a uh, Band-Aid record. You know, what? It just became the thing. Queues down the street just to buy a record. Instead of 100,000, it became millions of pounds.
I get a phone call. A husky voice. Hey, Geldorf. I said, yes, who is that? It's Harry Belafonte. Here's this grand old Marxist on the phone to me. You know, he's a bit of a hero of mine. He says, I'm ashamed that you Brit kids did this thing. And I said, Harry, I'm Irish, you know. And he goes, yeah, whatever, Brit, Irish, you know. I'm going to get Mike up to call you. And I said, OK. So, like, a couple of days later, hi, Bob. So I went over for USA for Africa. First, I'd like you to meet Bob Geldorf, who is really the inspiration for this whole thing. To put you in the mood of the song you're about to sing, which hopefully will save millions of lives, I think it's best to remember that the price for life this year is a piece of plastic seven inches wide with a hole in the middle. Before I went to California for the USA for Africa thing, uh, I went through the Sahel region of Africa where the famine was raging. I mean, 30 million people were about to die of hunger. Preposterous. I'd never been, you know. I'd certainly never been in sort of the killing fields, if you like. The things I'd seen, you know, were just... Well, indescribable is the correct word. You called it the pornography of poverty. Yes, it is. The press insisted I go. When are you going to Africa? I said, I'm not. And they said, why not? And I said, because I've seen it. It's on telly. I saw it. Did what I could. And they said, no, Bob, you've got to go. And I said, I don't have to go. I didn't have to go to Vietnam to know there was a war on. I was against it, did I? They said, OK, let me put it bluntly. The story is now you. And if you don't go, we, there's nothing for us to cover. You didn't want to be photographed with any of the victims. No, of course I didn't want to be photographed. The starving incident, yeah. It's horrific. Allow them at least their dignity in their agonizing death throes. You know, allow, allow them that. It struck me that bizarrely and counterintuitively, mankind is at his most elegant at their death. Men are most elegant at their death. They would give their last grain of wheat, which they'd scrabble in the ground for elegantly, like they kept their dignity. And they'd give it to their child. I don't want to be photographed with that child. Being made aware of what was happening in Africa. And doing nothing makes you complicit in a horror. Not to do it, knowing you could do it. Having said to people, I will, every penny you give, every cent will go directly to someone. Every cent, I promise, 30 years later, here I am still doing that. So you're kind of hung by your own petard, I think is the thing, you know. You keep sort of alluding to the fact you don't like yourself or you disapprove of yourself. I don't disapprove myself. I don't like myself much, no. You know yourself better than anyone and there's parts of you that you wish were other. The endless, uh, flaws. Um, you can work with them, you know, you can work around them, you can use them. And that's what people do, that's what everybody does within their own lives. Don't like to quote myself, but there's even a song, it's one of those days where I don't like myself, but I get along with me okay. Many others don't get along with me, that is. You know. <laughs> Hunger, lack of education, lack of health, corruption, conflict are just symptomatics of poverty. It's, it's economic, and the way to deal with that is through politics. The only way to engage in politics 
is to have a very powerful lobby with you. Again, it's paradox of individualism. Act in concert together for something else. And I thought, well, okay, let's just get the greatest artists in the world who sell the most records. Everybody watched. And I could go to the White House and to the Kremlin and to Downing Street and to the Elysee Palace with 1.3 billion people in my back pocket. That's pretty big lobby. With Live Aid, was there a moment when you realized this is going to work? I was very scared a lot of the time. I mean, properly frightened. You're a pop singer. Suddenly you're talking to Margaret Thatcher. You're talking to these people. You think, am I making a fool of myself? But the personal failure paled into insignificance alongside the actual failure of this thing not working on behalf of those for whom we were doing it for. The failure would be catastrophic. So it all comes to a head at this moment. The promise of rock and roll, the possibility of change, the ability to change things, using the language of rock and roll, using the platform it gives you. And not only that, but here are the guys that played this stuff to me when I was nine and 10 on that radio in Dunleary in Dublin. Here they all are. And here's this politics stuff I was doing in real time, now. And you can change things. You really can. The world is not immutable. Unbelievably beautiful day, scorching hot. My father was there, who I'd had a very difficult time with, sitting with Charles and Diana. There was the woman I was in love with, and here was my baby girl, and here were my mates in the band, and here were all these other giants who I'm still in awe of. And here was this audience, and we were doing it for nothing. And we were doing it for people who would never know we were doing it, and it was gonna work. We were going to tilt the world that way on its axis. We were going to do it, and I suddenly realized that and thought, it all makes sense <laughs> suddenly, you know? This is the best day of my life, yeah. Shoot. Ooh, 
I've just realized today is the best day in my life.